looking at the first 16 verses in John chapter 10 as we continue on with the this series, The Adventure of Following Jesus. And I was thinking how yesterday several of us had an adventure of following. We went on a hike and uh, Dave Melgren was our fearless leader. And I'm thankful we could follow him because he knew where he was going. He knew the path pretty well. It was not easy. There were a lot of ups and down hills. Uh, he had to have a fair bit of endurance. There were some beautiful vistas. And I thought, you know, that in some ways is an illustration of how it is at following Jesus. He knows where he's going. So we can confidently follow him. It is not always easy. There are a lot of ups and downs. Amen? Sure, we know. But there are beautiful vistas. And I, for one, would not trade the journey for anything. And I hope you would agree and feel the same way. The adventure of following Jesus is worth it all. The good, the bad, the difficult, the easy, whatever the case. So more of that this morning as we look at John's Gospel, chapter 10. And I think it's good for us to just take a look right away at the first 16 verses and let's see what the adventure is for us as we take a look where Jesus begins with those solemn words, which especially means pay attention, when he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he's a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. And when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. As I think what Jesus says about good shepherds, bad shepherds, I just cannot help but to think of two contemporary leaders these days as we consider these words. I'm not going to name names, but they're familiar if you follow the news at all. One is a heartless, ruthless dictator who is exploiting and destroying. The other is a respect, respected and a brave president who is showing some very genuine compassion, apparently, for the people that he leads. The contrast could not be greater. And they serve as some very modern illustrations for us, again, of good shepherds versus bad shepherds that Jesus talks about here. I want to set forth a premise right here at the beginning of our study that I think is important for us to consider. There is and there always has been a crying need for compassionate leadership. Deep down, I think that's what people want is compassionate leadership. We want that because our human nature 
is that we have a sheep nature, which I think Jesus very much is talking about here. So as such, we want and we need to be led. But because of that sheep nature, we sometimes get into trouble because we are not always so careful about who we choose to do the leading. But again, the fact remains we have a sheep nature and we want and we need to be led. I think the dilemma is summed up very well in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, probably a very familiar verse, but it just really zeroes right in on the heart of Jesus as our good shepherd when it says he looked at the crowds that he had compassion on them. And I note that it says because they were harassed and they were helpless, they were like sheep without a shepherd. That's how Jesus pretty much sized up humanity, and we might say we're included in that picture. That as he looks out, he has great compassion for us because we also are harassed and we are helpless. We are exploited by those who would choose to do so. We are often like sheep without a shepherd. We need leadership and we want compassionate leadership. So I would submit to you that the heart of true leadership is indeed that of compassion. Real leadership is compassionate. We desperately need that. We desperately want to have that kind of leadership. There again, because we have a sheep nature. And there's really much said in scripture about the fact that we as people are like sheep that need to be led. So that in mind, we look here in John chapter 10, and Jesus submits, I believe, the credentials of a good shepherd, because it's really about himself as a compassionate leader, a good shepherd. He tells us about illegitimate leaders, I think we'll call them such. Illegitimate leaders are those that exploit those that are entrusted to their care, according to verse 1. They come by stealth to steal. They sneak in. They're not concerned about the good of the sheep. Again, they come to steal. They come to serve their own purposes in that. Legitimate leaders, we might say, according to verses 2 and 3 that we just read, are self-authenticating. They lead through the proper channels. They are open. They are forthright. As he talks about the shepherd that doesn't climb over the fence but comes through the door, that comes in the right way. And so it is with compassionate leaders. He says the sheep hear his voice. Shepherds apparently, and I don't know that much about shepherds firsthand, but shepherds apparently are known to have a very distinct call or sound that they make that their sheep are uniquely accustomed to. And according to Jesus' words, sheep are suspicious and they are not prone to follow an unfamiliar voice. So they know that unique sound, that unique voice, that unique whistle, whatever it is, they know that about their true shepherd. Verse 6 that we just read, Jesus really, in the first five verses, is kind of using a type of a parable. And they're not understanding so that the sheep don't quite get the story that he's trying to share with them. And so beginning in verse 6, he wants to clearly explain what it is that he's trying to get across. So he says, truly, truly, I say to you that I am the door of the sheep. Very descriptive. We think of a door as an entryway. We entered through a door to come into this building this morning. And so it can be a type of an opportunity to enter through a door. Y'all ever watch the Price is Right game show on TV? Three doors. Door number one, door number two, door number three. If you guess the right door, there can be something fabulous on the other side. So it's a door of opportunity. I was thinking about an interview of a famous rock musician who told about a time that he was offered a record contract, life-changing contract. And he said it was like a door opened, and he said my life was on the other side, fame and fortune. So, door, when we think about a door, we think about Jesus saying that he is a door, a door of opportunity, great things on the other side. We testify to that. We've entered through the door of Jesus, and there is a great life that we enjoy because of that. 
Jesus said all of his predecessors, according to verse 8, were thieves and robbers. Probably good that we clearly understand what he's saying. Is he dismissing all the prophets and all the kings and all the great leaders we read about in the Old Testament? No. He's talking about the contemporaries, the false messiahs that knew the times and that were showing up. The false leaders that were there to exploit people. And so he said the contemporary thieves and robbers who have come before him. Verse 9, as we just read, Jesus says that he is the door to salvation and enrichment. We are saved through him. We come in and we go out and we find pasture. We find goodness in the truest sense. And wouldn't we say that to be saved is the greatest benefit of all. That's why we're here this morning. We are saved through the door of Jesus Christ. Is that not something to savor and value? Amen? Amen. We are saved through Jesus, our door. And so we've been saved from some things and saved for some things. I, for one, am so thankful I'm saved from the prospect of a fiery destruction some, someday. Because I'm a sinner. And that would be my fate otherwise. But Jesus rescued me from that, saved me from that. I don't fear burning in the lake of fire someday. We've been saved for immortality. Can you begin to wrap your mind around that? Much as I try, I can't begin to do so. What's it like to not mark birthdays anymore? What's it like to not show signs of aging, diminished energy, and you know, all that kind of stuff? What would it be like to have life in the fullest sense of the word, and that's, that's immortality, life in the age to come. That's our hope. That's our destiny. So Jesus, the door, has saved us and certainly will save us in the truest sense of the word when he returns. Legitimate leadership, as Jesus talks about it here, legitimate leadership serves and it sacrifices because Jesus says that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The very thing that Jesus knew he would do. And so the good shepherd indeed lays his life down for the sheep. I think it is so well summarized in Mark chapter 10. Verse 45, which I, I truly believe that's the theme verse of the Gospel of Mark in particular, but a great theme for the whole life of Christ. He said, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Great purpose statement of Jesus, the Good Shepherd. The one who most deserved to be served as God's Son said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve you. And the ultimate act of service was that of sacrifice. I came to offer my life as a ransom for many. In a lesser degree, I'm thinking about the Ukrainian president that I referred to a little bit ago. Early on in this horrible conflict, he was offered safe passage out of the country. Other leaders that were concerned for his safety I liked his words. He said, I don't need a ride, I need ammo. <laughs> that says this is a leader willing to sacrifice. What he's saying is I'm not going to turn tail and run in the midst of the crisis, which he could have easily done. I think that's a compassionate, legitimate leader that will do such a thing. That is really in many ways the example of Jesus. Not to turn tail and run away. Because he's not a hired hand, he's the good shepherd. And so to stay in the thick of it and to sacrifice, that's what Jesus has done for us. As he said in these verses, of course, a hired hand doesn't care about the sheep. And so in the face of a crisis, he would take the ride. He would get away from it all. Jesus, the good shepherd, tells us in verse 14 that he knows his own and his own know me. Jesus know if you belong, knows if you belong to him. He knows who's signed on the line and who hasn't. And those who have, he knows your name. He knows who you are. He loves you because you belong to him. Jesus has not forgotten. Sometimes we need that reminder. 
I'm just a nameless follower of Christ. No, you're not. He knows every detail of your life. He knows your name, and he knows concerning your commitment. He knows you, and you know him. And when you get right down to it, that's the only thing that matters, especially come day of judgment, is whether he knows your name and you know who he is. Because at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, he says, On that day, and I believe that's the day of accounting, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? And do mighty works in your name? Sounds pretty impressive. But he said, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Not about the show. Not about those things that seem impressive. The only thing that matters, apparently, Jesus is on that day, is whether he knows you and you know him. So to know the good shepherd is the ultimate priority for each one of us. Compassionate leadership is about genuine unity in the very last verse that we read this morning, verse 16. It's kind of intriguing because Jesus says, I have other sheep, he says to the people of Israel, I have other sheep which are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. That really reminds me of his prayer before his suffering in John 17, praying for great unity of those who would belong to him. But Jesus says he has other sheep besides the Jewish nation, the people of Israel. And I think every one of us can be very thankful that he has other sheep because we are the other sheep, aren't we? We are those that are grafted in. Romans chapter 11 talks about that. That's a great chapter spent time there you do well to study that because this is really the overall plan that God has of the tree uh, uh, Israel is represented as a tree and of course we know how disobedient they have been because of their disobedience he's grafted in the non-Jews which are us so we're part of that literally a tree of life God's not done with them he still got a plan for them as well so again a great chapter for you to study if you have not done so but again we can be thankful that we are part of that one flock under one shepherd. Jesus, the good shepherd, the legitimate leader, the leader who is open and forthright, the leader who is compassionate, the leader who serves and who sacrifices. And as he said, he is the door. He is the gateway to life, gateway to great blessings. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus speaks to a church in a city called Philadelphia in what is modern-day Turkey. And he said, I know your works. And he says, Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. So we might say Jesus, the door, speaks about a door that he set before that particular church, a door of opportunity. Indeed, the door... Jesus, our good shepherd, does set before us great doors of opportunity. This is a great application of what we're looking at. Three passages that I share with you, one out of Acts 14, verse 27. It says, Paul and Barnabas, when they had arrived, they gathered the church together, the church at Antioch, and they began to report all things that God had done with them and how, notice this, how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. A door that we have walked through as Gentiles. A door of opportunity. He was thankful for that. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9. The Apostle Paul says, A wide door for effective service has opened to me and there are many adversaries. That's the way it works. There are opportunities and there is opposition. That's how the plan of God works. But Paul was thankful for a wide open door for effective service. The door Jesus Christ opens up doors of opportunity for his people. Finally, Colossians, the fourth chapter, verse 3. Paul talks about praying for the church, praying at the same time for us as well. He said that God will open up for us, to us, a door for the word. 
so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have been in prison. Paul the prisoner, still seeking a door of opportunity, a great wide door of opportunity. Such as it is in the adventure of following Jesus. We are called to be doorways through which others can come and meet and know the good shepherd who promises life and life more abundant. We have doors of opportunity. Again, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Indeed, we cannot think of Jesus the good shepherd without thinking about his father, our father, who also is the good shepherd, like father, like son. Couldn't help but think of the 23rd Psalm, a much loved passage. And I thought it good to read it this morning, and I don't know if you can read it on the screen, but if you so desire to recite it with me, I think it's a pretty important reminder of the good shepherd of our Heavenly Father and, of course, the good shepherd of the Lord Jesus. So I'm going to read it, and if you can see it and want to read, you're welcome to do so. You may know it well enough from memory anyway, although I'm using a different translation. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So reassuring and peaceful to read that and to hear that. The Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. The chief shepherd that Jesus refers to himself as in John 10 that we have just looked at. Our compassionate shepherd extends a phenomenal promise to us. A crown of glory, as Peter called it. Crown of glory is abundant life. It is a position of honor. It is immortality in the coming age. And again, he calls his own sheep by name. He knows your name. He knows those who belong to him. And how is it that we belong to him? We belong to him through repentance, through, through faith, through water baptism. Submit to you that perhaps the biggest takeaway from our study here this morning is to make sure and settle the issue as to whether you are Jesus' sheep or you are not. He knows where things stand, whether you pretend that he does not. He knows where things stand based on your decision or your lack of decision. I think this is an important enough issue for us to pause for a time of silent prayer, to meditate for a little bit and let the shepherd speak to you about where things are spiritually, whether you have made a deliberate decision to be a sheep or not.